it's the next level. Vesemir said to me that the world outside these walls is a dangerous place. But times are changing. Even here. Hey, panelers. Welcome to the show. I'm Steve. Hi, guys. I'm Lara. And this is going to be a spoilerful podcast about the second episode of The Witcher Season 2. So, Lara, why don't you give us uh, the title of the episode and a little synopsis that IMDb gave us? Sure. Uh, episode is episode 2 is called Care Moran. And the synopsis is Seeking a Safe Place for Siri, Geralt Heads for Home. But danger lurks everywhere, even in Kaer Moran. Yennefer's dreams could be the key to her freedom. Hmm, very cool. I went back and I rewatched uh, Season 1, Episode 3, Betrayer Moon, which is, that's the one that the, the, the girl prostitute talks about. Um, it had the same girl, she says she, she washed Wyvern, or she washed something out of his hair, and he corrects her and says Basilisk. it was Wyvern. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, and it was Wyvern blood, but it was the, the episode uh, that she's referring to was uh, the one about the Striga. With the, oh, okay. the princess, the the brother who had uh, impregnated his sister, and then mm -hmm. the whatever the court guy had put a curse on her, and uh, he had to fight the Striga until the sun rose. He had to, he couldn't let it get back into its crypt. He wanted to break the curse, not kill the Striga. Mm -hmm. So he broke the curse by fighting with it until the sun came up, not letting it get back into its crypt yeah. before the sun the sun came up. Uh, it's also the episode where Yennefer got her beauty as well. Okay. So, so that was the same prostitute? Yes, that was the same prostitute. And, and apparently now she's running the house. Yeah. So it's it's been a little <laughs> she bit got a of, promotion. A little bit of time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so that's what the episode is, is kind of based on. And uh, so what were your initial thoughts there? So I had to watch this one a few times. Um, it was really dense, especially Yennefer's storyline. It's there was it's just like you know Game of Thrones. There's there's so many characters, all these religions, all these gods, and everything. So I was just trying to get that straight. And um, so actually, for extra credit, <laughs> I went and watched uh, The Witcher: Nightmare of the Wolf, which oh, yeah. I would highly recommend. It is really good. It's animated, but it gives us some of the backstory that we've heard um hints about but we haven't seen yet if you haven't read the books or played any of the games um it gives us vesemir's backstory it tells us like the really horrific way that these young boys become witchers uh it gives us the backstory of what happened to Cameron, uh what led to its downfall and yeah um, you know i highly recommend watching it if you want some of this like backstory because i don't know if we're going to get it in the show and i'll try not to spoil parts of it but yeah it gives you a lot of background no so thank that you actually that, cause... uh that actually helped me like the episode a little more because i could understand it in context yeah, and thank you for that, because I had a lot of questions. My notes are kind of all over the place uh, with this one. So I've got a bunch of, like, everything's intermixed in in between my different topics. So we'll uh, see how that goes. But I, I enjoyed this episode a lot. It it, uh, it brought back memories of my uh, my military days and the, the kind of the camaraderie that we see there among the witchers. Uh, I, was, I was never at a party quite that uh, outrageous, <laughs> um, but we did have some good times. I, I will say, so it was it was nice to see the different the different witchers, and I think I counted there at the end, and I think there was more than ten, but there wasn't twenty. So they've definitely lost uh, a few, as he says at the beginning of the episode when Siri asks, you know, how many are there, and I think he says like, well, there there were twenty, but I have no idea how many are there now. Um, yeah. And we know they they lost one for sure because in that same episode, Betrayer mm -hmm. Moon, uh, he finds one of the witchers that have uh, died. Yeah, because he didn't know it was a Striga. He thought it was a different, uh, like a beast. werewolf it, creature. Yeah, a werewolf type creature, and not uh, not uh, the Striga. So, uh, yeah, unfortunately. 
Uh, so you had, I, I like this. You did a little bit of, of digging and, and kind of revealed some of our new faces and places that we've got here. Um, so I kind of highlighted the different ones that you put in the doc. So if you want, let's do those first before we get into our topics. So we kind of set up uh, who's in in what place. Because that's kind of in my notes as well. But again, my notes are just really scattered. Uh, so we find ourselves, um, Siri and Geralt, going to Kaer Moren, which is the Witcher's winter home, um, highly secretive, where the Witchers go to rejuvenate and heal and refresh their potions and elixirs. This one is the School of the Wolf, where Geralt trained to be a Witcher, and there are other Witcher schools throughout the continent as well. Oh, see, I wasn't aware of that. That's kind of cool. Um, we also meet uh, Vesemir. He's the mentor, the trainer, kind of a father figure to all the remaining uh, witchers here at Kaer Moran. And, you know, it's they talk about it in one of their conversations. Geralt talks about the fact that he's the last one. Vesemir was the was the last one left to train all of these other guys. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that this this culling or whatever happened to uh, to kill a bunch of witchers, that's that's what you're saying is in that nightmare of the wolf. Um, okay. Have to check that out. And again, I don't want to give away what happens. You just, you have to go watch it. <laughs> um, we also get to see Eskel in this episode. He is one of Geralt's brothers in the School of the Wolf, and, uh, he has apparently, uh, just gotten into a bit of a tussle with a leshy. A leshy, yeah. Uh, we meet Francesca, the elf. This is a female, she's, that was the mage, right? The female mage mm -hmm. elf. She's kind of leading this band of renegades. Um, she re replaced that guy, Phila, 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 um, <laughs> Phila Vandral, um, who, he was the guy we met in the season one, right? Who was kind of leading mm -hmm. that group that Galt, uh, Geralt kind of interacted with, um, and she's having these visions of this ancient prophet. And we'll talk more about that because that's a whole huge part of, of the episode itself. Yeah. And we've seen him before, like you said, but returning is Philavandral, the former king of the elves. Um, Geralt and Yaskir met him in season one in the, in the episode where they met each other. And they went to um, go find a goat man hiding in the mountains. Um yeah, and that episode was also the inspiration for Yaskier's very catchy toss a coin to your witcher. <laughs> very catchy, very catchy tune. The song that gets yeah. stuck in your head. Exactly, exactly. Very, very good. So with that, uh, and one of the others was called Lamb Chop, they kept calling I don't know if that was his actual name or like a nickname. I'm not sure, but they did definitely have one called Lamb Chop. Oh, and I'm I think it's Lambert. Lambert, no, the, I mean, the subtitle said Lamb Chop, though. So maybe oh, his no, name I is think, Lambert. Yeah. I yeah, think and his they nickname call him is Lamb Chop. Chop. <laughs> right. Gotcha. Okay. That, that makes sense. Well, with that, uh, we can kind of get into our top five discussion points. And uh, just to let you listeners know, uh, Laura and I have not discussed our top fives this week, our discussion points. So neither one of us knows what the other one uh, has up their sleeve. So uh, we're, we're going in blind, uh, doing something a little different than we've usually done. So we'll see uh, how that how that works. So as I said to Daphne, uh, when we recorded for Snowpiercer, I am a gentleman all the time. That's the way I was raised. So I will let the lady go first. Yeah, you're so sweet. And I'm hoping that you have some points that I had to leave out because I just had so many points this episode that I couldn't get them into five. So I'm hoping you have got them on yours. There I am, freezing my bollocks off in the middle of a grain field for the second straight night, when the farmer's wife comes sneaking out to tell me that I'm wasting my time. It wasn't a mora her husband saw leaving their room. No. It was the fucking field hand! <laughs> Oh, now she's wailing. Oh, oh, what are we going to do? My husband won't pay you if you don't deliver a more ahead. <laughs> so I pulled out my sword and I said... My number five highlight was the frenemy road trip with Yennefer and Frangilla. Um, we we completely forget forgot to mention in the last episode that they were captured by elves. Um, now they're, they, they, their whole party got killed. They're, they wake up and they're in this caravan, um, 
apparently captured by elves. They find out that they've both been having these prophetic dreams and Yennefer's dream at the very beginning, which kind of throws you off a little bit, is her having an ordinary life with Geralt and expecting a baby. Starts off as a dream, becomes a bit of a nightmare when she sees a red-robed figure taking her baby away and the the uh, the crib sets on fire uh, and they team up to try to get away from the elves. Yeah, this was an interesting because the, the opening was kind of mine, mine, that whole dream within a nightmare kind of thing was my kind of first point. And it kind of it threw me off a little bit at first. I was like, am I what did I skip over something or have I missed something? Uh, but no. And I, you know, that's interesting. You bring up the the elves because I've got that is, is intermixed in my points as as well. But, um, you know, we noticed that we see that the baby when she that the cloak figure is carrying has uh elven ears uh obviously that's a tie into her elven bloodline her father was half elf um and she sees a red a, a red robed person uh frangilla sees a white robe no the wait which one was the white robe which was the black robe the black robe was frangilla's dream it was frangilla's right and then the white robe was the elf uh francesca's dream mm-hmm so I, that's all it, that's kind of all kind of do you think there was significance of the color of the different cloaks was it just the way it was you know is this I'm throwing a bunch of stuff in here cuz like I said my notes are all over the place um is this foreshadowing to what we're going to get with Jennifer or is it just what she wanted cuz that's you know the the demon uh we'll talk about the witch in the woods uh at some point as well, the dreams let's, let's, but we'll stick with the dreams right now. The dreams are showing them what they want, right? Cause it's showing Jennifer. She wants a baby. She wants a life with Geralt. Um, even if she doesn't realize that that's what she wants, that's what, uh, kind of what she, what she's longing for. But I think by the end of the episode, even the, the dream starts to kind of change into you want something different. Mm-hmm. Um, Frangilla wants the, the usurper, to be able to take control, who has control of Nilfgaard, but wants them to also uh, finish their conquering ways. And then, of course, the the Francesca wants the elves to be restored to power as they were before. So the the elves were kind of the power before the conjunction. Mm-hmm. Is that what we're to understand? Okay. Yeah, so, I think they so were yeah. the indigenous people of the continent. And apparently this um, conjunction happens that we get little bits of information on. And that's when humans and monsters were kind of multiverse teleported into the continent. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, what do you think? Is there any significance of the color of the robes or? You know, I didn't think about it, but just like off the cuff, um, the dream tells Yennefer that she wants power. And in a lot of cultures like Asian cultures, red is a is a is a color of power. Um, Frangilla is looking for hope, and so her um, dream is wearing the white robes, uh, maybe symbolizing hope. And Frances, I'm sorry, Francesca, not Frangilla. And Frangilla, um, I think she was trying to overcome fear because she said that her dream was of. Um, I forgot. I didn't write down his name, but that that soldier, the Nilfgaard soldier who saved her after she'd been kind of imprisoned in a playhouse for several years. So right. Maybe the black indicates fear or trying to overcome fear. It could be. Also, it could be the red for Jennifer because she used that fire and she burned out her power, apparently, that we see at the end. She can't portal out. And even the, the, the witch kind of asks her that. Well, how, why haven't you portaled out? Mm-hmm. Yet and, and Jennifer realized and we see her that was so it was I didn't understand it the first time through so the second time through I really got the anguish in her voice as, she, as I'm realizing she's running she's all by herself she's obviously she's broken off from Prendrilla and and that group apparently anyway and she's running through trying to portal and she can't do it and mm-hmm. that just that anguish on her face and the actress played that so well was was really really great so yeah. And I think you kind of got it in the dream too, or in the hut, because she's she's got her, she's faced with her first test that she ever had um, as a sorceress, where she had to make the um, stone levitate, and she's trying to do it. Should it should be so easy for her, but she can't do it. Wow! Yeah, so powerful stuff. All right, so what's your next one? 
Uh, my highlight number five is Papa Geralt. <laughs> Uh-huh. And despite his denial and reservations, Geralt is kind of becoming a dad, or at least a father figure. Uh, you know, Eskel provokes him by saying if he was ever given a princess, he would not be playing the knight. And that provokes Geralt to be a little aggressive with him. Um, the madam, the prostitute, says to him, uh, you know, he he's become a father. And she's like, well, if you don't want her, you know, we'll take her. And she'll be so popular with the boys and Gerald gets really pissed off with that and so she's like oh and you say you're not a father so Mm -hmm. um, he has that nice talk that little heart to heart with Vesemir about you know when you know how did you do it you you were left with all these orphan boys and he says he didn't you know he he taught them to you know protect themselves themselves. for themselves is uh what he said yeah which at the very end you know plays out because you see um Geralt speaking to Siri, and he realizes, which, you know, as a parent of two girls myself, and any parent knows you can't always be there to protect them as you would like them. You can't build a bubble around them because he was hoping to take Siri there and, and build a bubble around her. And he realized even in Care Moran, she's not safe. So he has to teach her to protect herself when he can't. Yeah, exactly. And I, I love that scene at the end when he hands her a sword and he says, keep your sword close. Mm-hmm. Um, and and then they're training, and I don't, you know, was that still was that Eskel's blood still on his blade, or was the blade burnt because of the fire? I wasn't sure, but it was, it it was very a powerful scene. Yeah, I didn't even notice that. Yeah, the end of his blade I noticed in the second watch is still like it's either black from being on fire or it's it's the blood is stained it. I don't I don't know. So it'll be interesting to see going forward what his blade looks like like next next episode to see if he's got it cleaned off or not yet. So, yeah, that was my number four. Uh, Geralt's becoming a dad, which is funny because Henry Cavill looks like he could just be maybe Siri's older brother. <laughs> but you have to realize <laughs> yeah. he's probably uh, maybe a hundred or a couple hundred years old. At least. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, my next one was I wanted to talk a little bit about the elves. We've already kind of talked about them. Um, the, you know, they're digging at that place that looks like Eratushka, that looks like that tower. Uh, and they said, you know, that uh, the... Elves, no, that Sintra burnt it down or something like that. I, I didn't understand that whole conversation. They, the thing is, Sintra used to be an elven city. And um, this the tower that they saw looks like the tower at Eratusa, um, because I, that was also an elven um, establishment. But they burnt this one down because they said they'd rather burn it than leave it for the humans. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. And so they're digging, they're digging, they're trying to find this, this passageway, or they're trying to find this, this, uh, altar, whatever it was, they finally find it and they get these stairs going down into the, into the ground. Um, that's when we get the information about Phila, Lang- Phila, Phila, uh, losing his throne and kind of being where Francesca's kind of taking over, took over as the leader because she's the mage and she was having these visions. Um, uh, Yennefer reveals to them that she's part that she's part elf and she says that there's no full-blooded elves being born. Now does that mean is this whole group not full-blooded elves or are they the last of the full-blooded elves? I'm guessing some of them if they're old enough are full-blooded elves, but probably mm-hmm. the younger ones have intermixed with humans because there's probably so few elves remaining. Right. Okay. And it sounds like they're not really able to even bring full-blooded elves to term. Right, because Francesca says she's never brought one to, to term. So I don't know if she's attempted to bring a full-blooded elf to term or not. So, uh, But I thought all that was, was interesting and that, that that was what her – that was part of her dream. You know, not just to restore the elves to power, but she wants them to be <sighs> – you know, I hate to put it like this, but she wants it to be clean blood, a clean bloodline again. She doesn't want mixed bloodlines. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's an interesting, interesting story arc uh, that, to see how that how that moves forward. So uh, I just I just thought that was interesting, all the different elves and, and seeing what they were doing and the, the song. Yennefer says she's never heard the song with words. She's only he- heard the music. Um, and I don't know where she heard that music from or if she was lying. I don't know. Which is different than like a lot of um, 
fant- high fantasy stories. Usually the elves are these regal creatures and they're usually the most intelligent and the most advanced of the races. And here they're, they're basically refugees in their own land. They've been completely displaced and they're essentially trying to be wiped out by the humans. I mean, uh, Calanthe, uh, Ciri's grandmother, was, was notorious for trying to mm-hmm. wipe out the elves. Yeah, so there's de- definitely been this clash between the humans and the elves for a long time, and and uh, we're going to see more of that apparently going forward, especially now that Fringilla has kind of form- formed this loose alliance, I guess, with the elves and taking them to the north to see if the north is going to accept them. Uh, we'll see. Uh, but yeah, that was mine, just kind of more talking about the elves and stuff. So uh, what's your next point? Um kind of touching back on the dreams again with of the three robed figures and the deathless mother um so like you said francesca and the elves have been searching for this uh, secret passage under this ruined elven city um the altar that they find is uh etheline a sacred elven prophet um and each of them, I think we've kind of discussed this pretty well, that, you know, they each get something they desire. I do find it funny that Francesca and Frangilla, they kind of come to this shared purpose of helping each other to get what they want. But Yennefer's dreams, um, you know, she dreams of this child, but then the child kind of turns on her and points out to her that you don't really want a child, you want power, and now you've lost your power, and, you know, what are you going to do about it? And she, she gets really, um, really, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not at a loss for it. She's, she's just, she's unkind to her, and then she, um, she actually reveals her true face to Yennefer. She's the only one that she reveals mm-hmm. her true face to. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit because let me because I've got some of this in my notes as well that I thought was interesting. That as I watched it the second time, each of them kind of I think Yennefer was the first one to kind of figure out that she wasn't actually talking to the person that she thought she was talking to because, and I think that's because she wasn't talking to someone who she had a real memory of, I'm assuming. And so she was able to figure out that, wait a minute, you're not really, this is not really your face. And so Yennefer is starting to figure out you're not. And then we see Frangilla. I think Frangilla was next that she started to go, wait a minute, you're not that night. You're something else. And then we see the same thing with Francesca where she's like, you're not Ilithania. You're, someone else and you see this slow this slow dawning on each of them that they're dealing with something else and i loved how it it wasn't spoken directly but i think it had to be the demon the demon right the demon that killed clef that the Mm -hmm. the witchers uh secluded in the woods because obviously this is the witch in the woods and she's trying to find a way to get out Mm-hmm. And there, uh, that's I just I just love the whole intertwining of that story because I didn't I don't think I really figured it out the first time watching it, but it was the second time watching it through. I went, oh, they're in her woods. They're not just in any woods. They're in her woods, and that's what uh, yet Vesemir says. He says anyone who enters her woods begins to hear this calling, and so that's when I started drifting about it, not necessarily being foreshadowing of what is going to happen to Yennefer, but more of what she kind of wants to happen Mm -hmm. of having a child. So yeah, all that stuff uh, was really, really great. And I just, I I love seeing the, the, the way these stories intertwine and and getting to see it earlier rather than later. Cause I think the, the last time when, when Mark and I did season one, we basically had both watched all eight episodes kind of in a binge. And when we did the podcast on it, we we were rewatching the episodes, mm-hmm. so we're we were kind of starting to see those little interwoven uh, kind of things, and and we realized that that Geralt was there at the 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 castle there in episode three. We see Geralt when they're children; he's there, and then now as as old as the old man uh, king is king now, he's that's the boy that Geralt saw. Yeah. You know, when he was a child. So it's all this kind of stuff that, that we start to see. We start to realize that, that again, going back to that episode three of season one, we figure out in that episode that Yennefer's origin story is many years, 30, 40 years before the storyline. I'm sorry, it was it was Yennefer interacting with the 
the girl and the and the king, oh, the, yes. the, uh-huh. the brother and sister, and we so we see so we realize that her origin story is many many years before she even meets Geralt, mm-hmm. and and so starting to see those kind of things and those connections just makes you get excited about where the series is going to go and what we're going to learn uh, moving forward. Um, I have no idea where we're at because, like I said, my notes are all over the place. So I'm going to jump into one. Uh, the artifacts that um, Siri is looking at as she's kind of exploring the the Witcher castle, and, and you know, Eskel tells her it's not a castle; it's a shithole. And <laughs> but yet she's looking at all these different things, and then she encounters v- Vesemir, who starts to tell her some of these stories. And he's like, "Well, this is Kelf's armor, and this is what was used to kill him." And uh, I read a little of the IMDb that some of those swords and stuff are actually from the game or Easter eggs of the game. And I guess the books, if you know the books and when he hangs up Eskel's necklace with all those other necklaces, I was looking for the one from that episode betrayer moon. I think I saw it in there, but I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I mean, it had to be there because Geralt should have brought it back. Mm-hmm. You would think at some point for them to add to that collection. Yeah. If he was from the same Witcher school, so I don't know. We'd have to go back and watch Betrayer Moon and see if it was a wolf on the medallion. I think it was. I'm pretty sure it was a wolf type. It was some sort of wolf type creature that uh-huh. was that was on there. So um, because they didn't, it, all the the medallions were slightly different. They weren't all the same kind of sigil. They were they were slightly different. And I think his. I'm pretty sure that that one was a was a wolf. And I would expect that's why Geralt took it. Uh-huh. In in epi- in that episode there in season one. Cool. Um. So let's see where we're at. Are we at your number two or your number one? I'm at my number two. Okay. Okay. Which is the influence of Russian and Slavic folklore in this episode. I'm a big fan of ancient mythology and folklore. And okay, I'm gonna try this again. <laughs> Andrea Sapkowski, okay, <laughs> the writer of The Witcher. Um, similar to another one of my favorite writers, Neil Gaiman, um, he weaves a lot of ancient mythology and folklore into this world, especially where he's from, um, you know, that Slavic uh, folklore. And if you're familiar with that, you will no doubt um, relate The Witch in the Woods to the Baba Yaga, which oh. is a Slavic um, kind of boogeyman. Well, it's not a boogeyman at all. It's really supposed to be a, an old woman, an old hag, an old witch that lives in the woods. Um, traditionally, she lives in a house uh, that's supported by chicken legs. And um, she lures young children into the forest to eat them, which is exactly what Frangilla tells um Yennefer, she says her dad used to tell her tales of the witch in the woods who lured children into the forest to boil and eat them. Um, even the incantation that Francesca says to, at the hut say, that says, hut, hut, turn your back to the forest, turn your front to me, and it spins around like that, that is right out of the stories and legends of the Baba Yaga. Oh, wow. That's really, really cool. Very good. Yeah, I love that scene that that her repeating that incantation and the hut spinning around toward her, and then they're all kind of sucked into it, transported into it as their as their dream. And we figure out that their dreams have not been dreams; it had been this witch putting it into their their minds. So, uh, very very cool. Let's see. Um, I've almost got all of mine. Um, but I wondered how long is winter going to last? Because you mentioned at the beginning that that's what Vesemir says, that this is where they stay for the winter. I wonder if we're going to get several episodes here in uh, Caramoran or if it's they're going to like do a time jump mm-hmm. or something to get us through the winter. I, I, I'm interested to see where the next episode goes and how long it covers uh, time-wise. But I loved, I just loved the interior of Caramoran because it looked like it was, it, as he walks in, it almost looked like it was that abandoned village from the last episode as well. But yet, but this time there's fires going and you can hear noise and stuff. Uh, and I absolutely loved that scene with him up on the, the telephone pole things mm-hmm. doing the training. It reminded me of a, a, a 80, 90s movie, Rima Williams, uh, where he's training uh, for karate and stuff. And Rima Williams was a, a series of novels that were written about this guy who was training to be a martial arts master. And uh, 
they did a, a movie about it with Fred Ward. So, I saw that. Wasn't it called like Remo Williams? The adventure begins and ends because that was the yeah, only because they never went anymore. Only yeah, movie. it had it had Joel Gray Joel G- Gray playing this this ancient uh, uh, ancient uh, Asian uh, karate master. Uh, it even had uh, Kate Mulgrew was was in it, and uh, like it's late eighties, early nineties. I can't remember. It had one of the classic. Uh, uh, Statue of Liberty fights mm-hmm. is in there and uh, just just there's some great lines in it that I, I really liked. And it's it's one of my it's one of those those, uh, you know, guilty pleasure kind of movies that didn't do really well. But it's it's fun. It's a fun watch if you ever get a chance. To do I always it. thought it was funny that it's called The Adventure Begins and never <laughs> went anywhere yeah. from that. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, well, so what yeah, is your number Cameron one? Cameron is uh, in ruins because of everything that happened in the Nightmare of the Wolf, and that apparently they never went back to fix it up again. Yeah, but it's it's it makes for a good hideout, I guess. Uh, you know, in the winter, except it's cold. Yeah. <laughs> I love that exchange between him and Siri, where she says she found a room that had rats in it, and he goes, "Well, that must be one of the warm ones." Yeah. Then. <laughs> and I think they do a really good job of making it look cold, kind of like in you know the. Um, the Starks home in Winterfell, you know, it, it just looks cold all the time. <laughs> yeah, I, I love I it's one of my favorite things to watch, whether it's real life or on uh, or a fictional show to see snow on an HD TV. So it's just it's it's I love watching the little flakes and being able to see it on a, on a high definition TV. <laughs> all right, I'll get to my number one. And so my number one was the theme of legacy and progeny. Um, we learn from the witch's hut that Francesca's pregnant, but she's never been able to bring any of her pregnancies to term. Uh, Yennefer says that there hasn't been a pure born elf in ages and the mages and the witchers of the continent, though long lived, aren't able to have children. Um, they're made, not born. Uh, so what does, I'm wondering if legacy is going to have a big, um, a lot of concentration in this series because there's a lot of focus on children and the ability or inability to have children and um, also kind of like building foster families like Tissaia and Vesemir. They basically become foster parents to their students. Um, It just seems like there's a lot of focus on legacy and progeny and they also mention that the monsters aren't able to reproduce. So basically, yeah. if the monsters are gone, then, you know, there's not any more coming. And, um, but they, they could, something could happen with the monsters because apparently this leshy they find is different than other leshies. It seems to be mutating. Yeah. And that was another question that I had that I was a little confused about is, is we've heard several times in both seasons, um, Characters refer to witchers as mutants, which are my understanding that mutant, if mutant has the same definition all across the board, it's someone who's born with some sort of power or, or something like that. But then we also know that they do go through some sort of training as well, some sort of extensive training. So I wonder if maybe the witchers, the witchers prior to the group we have now were more like naturally born who were just trained into having these skills and these fighting but with when the nightmare of the wolf happened which i'm going to have to watch now because that was a huge part of my notes was not understanding what was going on there um i'm going to need to watch that um after that happened it seemed like the ones that desimir was left with to train were these mutant Mm -hmm. witchers and and so i'm excited to see if we get to see any more because none of the other guys that I noticed anyway had the eyes like what Geralt has. Um, but I, I'm I'm excited to see what these other uh, witchers, if if we get to see them do any sort of fighting uh, separate from, from Geralt. But I mean, what do you think about that as far as whether is this group mutants? Were they mutants or is it a different definition of mutant? Well, I'll let you know that some of these witchers are in Nightmare of the Witch or Nightmare of the Wolf. And, um, they are mutated through magical potions and mutations that they take. It's a, it's a ceremony called the trial of the grasses where they have to 
endure, and I think they mentioned it in season one too, they have to endure, endure this sort of magical mutation that transforms them. Um, so it's unlike, you know, like the X-Men, they're not born with these gifts, but okay, they're given but they're to them. they're mutated. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. That makes, that makes sense, I guess. Um, my final one is, is just, again, I, I keep going back to these Monster of the Week fights that are just so good. And I... You know, it was it was dark. It, it was a very dark scene. I don't mean like like light wise. It wasn't very. It was dark. So I'm not a guy who I don't know that much about CGI, but it looked really good to me. Like the CGI of him fighting Eskel as the Lechi was really really good. Every time they showed um, Eskel's kind of face and 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 mouth and stuff, it, there was only one moment where it looked like he had some sort of gigantic tongue. <laughs> <laughs> in there uh, that kind of took me out of it. But other than that, th- that fight was really, I mean, it was great when he burns the tentacle and he's able to get past it. And then there at the end with him and Vesemir fighting together back to back and, and then Vesemir kind of uh, trapping it and it grabbing Vesemir and Geralt, have we seen him? Has he done that before with his sword? He lights the sword. Um, yeah. Lighting no, we fire. haven't seen him do that before. Okay, I thought I had seen him do that before. That was really a cool effect to have him draw his hand along the the, the blade and it lights up on fire and then he stabs it through the heart because that's what they said at the beginning. You got to put fire through the heart to kill it. Yeah. You know, I thought was just great. I, I just these fight scenes to me anyway, and really you you got to figure that's that's Henry Cable or the, the stunt man maybe for part of it. I don't know. He probably does most of his own stunts. I would assume he's a young guy. He's pretty pretty powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, so he probably does most of his own stunts, but he's doing that with a, he's probably doing it with a tennis ball or some guy in a suit, you know, yeah. but he's got to act like it's this big, gigantic, huge monster that he's actually fighting. Yeah, I was hoping that you would bring up this point because I got to all the, my points. I'm like, I didn't even go, I didn't even cover the fight with the Leshy, but you're, I agree. The the CGI is pretty good. Um, I like the creature design. Um, I like that kind of like our creature from last week, the Bruxa, he almost is like a spider, like those wooden tentacles pull out and he climbs along the wall like a spider or an octopus or something like that. That was cool. And I, even um, when they're doing that autopsy on the arm of the Leshy that he he cut off, it's so disgusting when they cut Ugh. it open and there's all those grubs just climbing in there. Ugh, it's disgusting. Ugh, yeah, I was just like, oh, and, and girls just kind of looking at it. And I was like, don't, don't eat it. Don't eat it. Don't eat it. <laughs> like, I really thought he was going to take one of those. And just, but he didn't. So I'm glad he didn't. But uh, yeah, and I love Siri's like, oh, we're we're gonna get this. Like Siri, it's like she's going to school. She's like, oh, good, we're gonna spend the winter learning about monsters. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So it will be. Like I said, I'm interested to see how long we stay here in Cameron, and and what we get to see of Siri's training and and how that goes. But I'm 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 excited for everything that was set up. This this seemed again. There was a lot of setup things in this episode but that's what they do they set up for the next for what's coming on down the line set them up and knock them down that's it um so that has covered all of my points in my notes i don't think there's anything else um that i had um have we skipped over anything of yours um i have a few notes um it's not quite the orgy of season one but we do get a wild party at cameran with the witchers and the working ladies of the night (laughs) I, like, loved, I wonder I do we have that. to have one of these each season <laughs> <laughs> at least um yeah well you got to please those guys who like to see a little bit of skin you know oh, yeah uh, nothing wrong with that hey, ladies <laughs> like it too <laughs> <laughs> um yeah that was that was a good that was a good scene and i i liked that Geralt was kind of like the the you know, every party's got to have a pooper. That's why we invited you, you know, because yes. Geralt's like, we shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> Esco, why did you bring them in? <laughs> you know? Guys, well, where'd all these, where'd all these party goers show up from? <laughs> yeah. Mom yeah. and dad. You know, we're supposed to be secret. Yeah. <laughs> really, really good. I love it. I love hey, it. Even Vesemir um, doesn't seem to care that they're throwing a party. Yeah. And he's like, whatever. I think I think Vesemir at this point, I don't know how much older he is than the other witchers, but I think he's at this point where he's just like, whatever, you guys are going to do what you're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> boys be boys. Exactly. Um, just a few other things. Um, I did mention that earlier that the continent, um, kind of the stories of the continent are 
drawn on the cave walls about the conjunction of the spheres, spheres and the arrival of monsters. And um, when they're in that um, reliquary room, Siri and Vesemir, um, the nods to the nightmare of the wolf. Um, if you see the cartoon, there's nods to um, Vesemir's own mentor, um, Delg Deglin. Deglin's his name. And he, he does mention that Deglin died, you know, fighting a man. A human. Yeah. 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 So uh, that is actually um, shown in the cartoon. And we see the witcher's medallions vibrating when danger's nearby, as well as all the medallions on the tree. They start to vibrate. I didn't notice that. I was I well, I mean, I noticed it, but I didn't know what it meant. So mm -hmm. I, that's now I now I got it. Okay, so that's what that the that's what's that's what's magical about those medallions is mm -hmm. they they vibrate when danger is okay. Or monsters, I imagine, or when mon monsters are monsters. nearby. That's good. Okay. And those are my notes. Okay. Do um, you have any quotes? Um, a few. Vesemir, he says to um, es Eskel, fire through the heart is the only thing that puts them down. Six hours in, that didn't occur to you? <laughs> I love that line. I wanted to put that in there, but it was too quick for me to catch, so I'm glad you, I'm glad you got it. Um, my first one is, is uh, Yennefer to Frangilla when they're in, when they wake up after being captured, and, and Frangilla says, Fuck! <laughs> And Yennefer goes, finally, an honest response. We're stuck here together. Who knows? We may even become friends again. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Geralt, he says, we don't kill out of fear. We kill to save lives. Because mm -hmm. Geralt is trying to walk the righteous path. <laughs> Yeah, I I love I love that line when he's talking to Siri when he's at, when she's she's finally starting to open up to him because that's what he told Vesemir. He says I, I need her to open up to me about what happened because she lied to me about how she got out of Sintra and this and that. And so she's finally starting to kind of open up to him, and she says she wants to kill that night. And he says, "Well, we don't kill." I love, yeah, I just that was one of my favorite lines as well. Uh, my last one is, is kind of a fun one. It was the uh, right before we see Eskel's injury, but the girl says, you took on that wooden beast. Let me take on yours. <laughs> I'm <laughs> so. glad you wrote that one. I <laughs> didn't want to have to say it. <laughs> I figured I figured that'd be better for coming from me. So, <laughs> Well, I'll say my favorite from Danica, which was, I should know better than to bring my favorite whores to a witcher den. <laughs> that was that was great. I loved how, how they ran out, and I'm assuming they made it out alive. I... We didn't see them later. Oh, but, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> they run. That's uh, what they do. Yeah, I love that. We run. Witchers fight. Witchers, witchers fight. We run. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, any other quotes from you? Um, the witch says to Yennefer, and it's it's a little in, bit enigmatic, but she says, I'm going to let you bake some more. I want your desperation crisp. You will beg me to take it from you, and I will. So that's yeah. a little weird. I wonder what she means by that. I didn't understand that either because I thought that meant she was going to be staying in the hut. But then immediately after that line is said, she wakes up outside in the grass and she hears Frangilla and, and the elves. So, yeah, that's uh, this witch is going to I'm sure we're going to see more of this witch and uh, see what uh, what happens. Uh, I checked. Final, for, oh, I'm sorry. My final oh, go, yeah. one was I just love this because Geralt, it's the voiceover that we get as Yennefer's trying running through the woods, trying to build her portal and she can't. And Geralt says, you can't run from the world. You can't hide from it, but you can find power and purpose, a chance to survive the horror. And all you have to do, Siri, is keep your sword close and keep moving. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. I love that. Um, I checked. I didn't see any feedback um, uh, in the email or on Instagram. We did get some feedback from our good friend Derek over on Facebook. Derek uh, from TV Podcast Industries. He tells us, enjoying your coverage as always. I can't. I'm not going to even try to do his accent, Derek. I couldn't do it justice. So uh, enjoying your coverage as always. I really enjoyed this episode. Finally getting to meet Vesemir was great. He's perfectly cast in the role. A bit of banter from the rest of the Witchers really adds to the scope of the show. And the evil within came as a big surprise as it really felt like one of the ladies of the night was destined to be the monster of the week. <laughs> I agree, Eric. I uh, I did not Derek. Sorry, I just said Eric. Derek, uh, I agree. I I didn't I didn't expect the monster of the week to be one of our witchers. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I saw that they just posted their 
review for episodes one through four of The Witcher, but I will have to put it on my waiting list since we are going through these a little more slowly. Yeah, I'm going to have to wait. Listen once we're done. Yeah, definitely for sure. We'll be listening to their uh, to their coverage of those, and uh, uh, when they do the back half, maybe I'll we'll get to send them some feedback. We'll see. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, I, again, I didn't dig into any news because I don't want to get spoiled about anything. Um, as far as podcast recommendations, I think I have just the the normal one. Uh, I will say that House Podcastica wrapped up their coverage of Cobra Kai uh, this week, but they are continuing their coverage of the Book of Boba Fett. So if you're interested in either of those shows, check out House Podcastica at podcastica.com. And I will recommend, um, if you want to learn more about the Baba Yaga or any other kinds of mythology, uh, a podcast that I love listening to is called Mythology and Fiction Explained. And if you go to episode five, the entire episode is about the Baba Yaga. Very cool. The only thing I know about the Baba Yaga is from John Wick. So, (laughs) Which I think is so (laughs) funny because that's a guy it's a boogeyman and the baba yaga has never been depicted as a man but but as i've corrected people before john wick is not the baba yaga john wick is the man you send to kill the baba yaga <laughs> so if you remember from john wick uh, from john wick is he's the one who goes to kill the baba yaga <laughs> so um uh, it clears it very up very good Exactly, exactly. I don't know how people forget that, why people forget that all the time. Um, but as always, uh, if you're listening to us on your podcast player of choice and you're able to give us a review, we would love to to have that and be able to share it here. Uh, we also have a website, panels to pixels uh, You can get we will post every week in our Instagram feed and on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash panels to pixels and Instagram is panels to pixels podcast all completely spelled out. We also have a Twitter, which is at panels two pixels with the number two there in the middle. So it's panels two. I don't know why I'm holding my hand up with two fingers because they're not they're not seeing me. Um, panels two pixels, the number two right there in the middle for Twitter. And then our email address is panels two pixels one at gmail.com. That's panels two pixels one. The T O spelled out right in the middle. The number one at gmail.com. We are on YouTube at panels two pixels podcast. And just all the other wonderful things that you can find at nextlevelradioonline.com. Check out our network, Next Level, Next Level Network Online. It's a great network. Ben just put out another Wilhelm post, I think, with a uh, with Patrick Wayne. So that is very, very cool. Um, so check him out, Wilhelm. And let's see. Next time, we will be continuing through The Witcher Season 2 with Episode 3, which is entitled, What is Lost? Not a question. Like, what is? It's a show about what these characters that they 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 crash landed on this island in their. I still don't. Know. In their, I haven't seen. You've it. never. Oh my goodness! It's so good. Lost. I'm gonna uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so again, episode three. What is lost? I didn't read the synopsis of it yet, so, uh, but we'll have that out next week. Laura, Lara. I si, can't believe Laura. I messed that up. Uh, <laughs> Anything else you want to plug this week? I know you said you're, you've got a, a Adrenaline Cinema podcast coming up soon. It's coming up one of these days, and uh, I'll let you know when it does. Um, I don't have time to do my own podcast, but I thought in this segment, maybe I will just throw out ideas for podcasts, and uh, I can get feedback on whether it's good or not. Uh, this week, it's going to be um, the Charcuterie Board podcast. Yes, yes. Every episode will be brand new charcuterie board ideas. <laughs> charcuterie board podcast. I love it. Somebody out there's got to do that. It's, you know, British Bake Off had a podcast, so why not the charcuterie yeah. board <laughs> podcast? Uh, I don't know what you would call it. Um, as always, I send voicemails. You can hear me right here. Uh, you will hear uh, Daphne and I will be covering Snowpiercer again coming this week, the next episode. Uh, you can hear that. Those will be dropping on Wednesdays or Thursdays, and uh, this will be dropping soon as well. Uh, so we have come to the end. I'm Steve. And I'm Laura. And we'll see you. And this has been Panels to Pixels, and we will see you on the next panel. Good night. Good night.